One of the most iconic yet greatest queens ever to rule over England was the final Tudor monarch, Queen Elizabeth I. She, during her decades in power, oversaw a huge time of change in which there was a huge boom in culture. Writers such as Shakespeare were making a name for themselves and Elizabeth would also manage to see off a number of threats to her throne. A lot of people across England did not want the Protestant Elizabeth as their queen, and they preferred to turn to Mary, Queen of Scots, the Catholic former Queen of Scotland, to rule. Because of this, Mary was embroiled in a number of plots against the life of Elizabeth, and the Tudor Queen dealt with this once and for all by ordering her execution. As Mary, Queen of Scots's head was taken clean off by axe, but she also defeated the Spanish Armada the most feared and notorious fleet and army of the time. But Elizabeth was a queen greatly beloved by her people, and many could not imagine a world in which she did not rule over them. But as the year 1603 came, Elizabeth I was not as glorious as she once was, and she was a woman who was giving up on her life, and she was coming to terms with her own demise and death. However, she would be buried in a huge tomb, eventually. But this was broken into, and what those who did this found was shocking, strange, and incredible. In the early morning of the 24th of March, 1603, Queen Elizabeth I died. She was, by the standards of the Tudor period, a very elderly lady, and she had lived and ruled for many decades. But she was then succeeded by the Scottish King James, who was invited to come and jewel rule England and Scotland, meaning the end of the Tudor dynasty and the beginning of the Stuart dynasty. This would have greatly upset her father, Henry VIII, who at one point even barred the Stuarts from the throne. But Elizabeth had been ill for many months and her health was getting worse, and many people around her were beginning to believe that the end of her life was near. She was a woman who had survived many of the deadliest diseases of the 16th century, and she was afflicted, for example, with smallpox, and her face still bore the scars of the brutal disease. But in her final days, Elizabeth I was depressed, and often for long periods of time rather vacant, and she seemed long in thought. It's believed she was contemplating many of the decisions she had took as Queen of England, including ordering the execution of Mary, Queen of Scots, another anointed queen, and she was concerned that this would prevent her from one day getting into heaven. She was concerned about what was next, and the queen was almost 70 when she did eventually die. In her final days, she was accompanied and waited on by her servants and closest friends, as well as when she took to the deathbed the Archbishop of Canterbury. He promised Elizabeth not to worry, and she would go to heaven, and that she would rule one day again as a queen in heaven. She was also told her close friends had died, would be waiting for her, and that she should remain close to God in her final moments but her final moments were hard, and her throat swelled up, and speaking was a problem, but the Queen then gave up her fight against the illness that proved to cause her death. Inside of her private bedchambers within Richmond Palace, Queen Elizabeth I died, and she gave a number of instructions as to what should happen next following her death. It's well known that Elizabeth did not like the thought of being disemboweled and having her internal organs removed and then buried away from her body. But this was tradition for monarchs of the time, and despite Elizabeth saying she did not want this to happen, doctors and physicians ignored the request. Elizabeth's body was cut open, and her heart, along with other organs, were removed, and then her cavity was stuffed with spices to stave off decay. This eventually was a good thing to have happened, as during the funeral procession, the movement of the coffin on the procession may have caused the body of Elizabeth to explode, as violent gases emerged out of her body and even splintered the coffin. This subsequent posthumous explosion would have been worse without the embalming process. But Elizabeth was, following her death, left inside of a lead-lined coffin which was decorated with many Tudor images 
including roses inside of Richmond Palace, before the procession to Westminster Abbey began. This was a journey which had a number of steps. The coffin of Elizabeth was taken down the River Thames on the royal barge to the Palace of Whitehall. Her coffin had been draped in black velvet, and it was kept a close watch on by six of Elizabeth's ladies. It was said that during the procession on the River Thames that the oars at every stroke did tears left fall and the people of London were gutted about losing their queen. But the queen's body had been wrapped tightly in the coffin in cerecloth when the alleged explosion took place, but her remains regardless continued to Westminster Abbey, and on the 28th of April 1603, the funeral procession occurred to Westminster Abbey. It was said by onlookers that the city of Westminster was surcharged with a multitude of all sorts of people in their streets, Houses, leads and gutters that came to see the obsequy. There was as such a general sighing, groaning and weeping, as the like has not been seen or known in the memory of man. The coffin of Elizabeth I was decorated with a large effigy of her on the top, which was dressed in her Parliament robes, and on top of the effigy was the crown of the Queen, Her hands held the sceptres of power and the effigy was made from wax and also wood. But this was one of the first times that the people of London had seen their queen and what she looked like, as portraits were not readily available to the poorer people. The coffin was pulled by four horses and when it arrived at Westminster Abbey, the omen of the guard carried it into the church for the funeral service. The funeral of Elizabeth I was conducted by the Dean of Westminster, Dean Andrews, and after the funeral service, the coffin was carried into the Henry VII Lady Chapel. Her body was lowered into the same vault as Henry VII and Elizabeth of York, her grandparents, at the heart of the Tudor mausoleum, showing the respect that the people of England had for their queen. This was a huge honour, and was seen as a fitting tribute. However, in 1607... A number of years after her death, the body of Elizabeth I was moved, and her coffin was brought back onto the surface of the earth. James I, her successor, ordered that Elizabeth's coffin should be moved to be placed under a tomb which had been crafted showing her, but he also said that she should be buried in this new vault with her sister's coffin, sitting directly below her, symbolising how Elizabeth was much more significant in her reign to Mary I, who was also known as Bloody Mary. The tomb of Elizabeth was huge and large, and she was laid to rest in a room opposite Mary, Queen of Scots, James I's mother, and 46 shillings and 4 pence was paid for the removal of Elizabeth's body and the subsequent reburial. The tomb today is still spectacular, and Mary still today is buried underneath her half-sister. But in the 1800s, the burial vault of Elizabeth was broken into by curious members of Westminster Abbey. In 1880, a book was published by the Dean of Westminster, Arthur Stanley, who had been given special permission by Queen Victoria to explore the vaults and burial vaults of Westminster Abbey in order to create an inventory as to what was actually inside. He was looking in particular for the coffin of King James I, and he discovered this in the original burial site of Elizabeth I, in the burial vault of Henry VII and Elizabeth of York. But then Stanley was exploring other rooms off the royal vault, and he explored an aisle underground at the east end of the tomb of Elizabeth I, and he found a small opening in the walls. He crept through this, and then entered the burial vault, of Elizabeth I, and he noticed the two coffins which were in this. There were no other coffins, and the sanctity of the Tudor Queen's remains had been respected for centuries. Arthur Stanley wrote what he saw when he broke into the burial vault of Elizabeth I. The excavations, however, had almost laid bare the wall immediately at the eastern end of the monument of Elizabeth, and through a small aperture, a view was obtained into a low, narrow van lit immediately beneath her tomb. It was instantly evident that it enclosed two coffins, and two only, and it could not be doubted that these contained Elizabeth and her sister Mary, the upper one larger and far more distinctly shaped in the form of the body 
like that of Mary, Queen of Scots, rested on the other. There was no disorder or decay, except that the centering wood had fallen over the head of Elizabeth's coffin, and that the wood case had crumbled away at the sides, and had drawn away part of the vault of the decaying lid. No coffin plate could be discovered, but fortunately the dim light fell on a fragment of the lid slightly carved. This led to a further search, and the original inscription was discovered. There was the Tudor badge, a full double rose, deeply but simply incised in outline on the middle of the cover. On each side, the August initial E.R., and below the memorial date, 1603. The coffin lid had been further decorated with a narrow moulded panelling. The coffin case was of inch elm, but the ornamental lid containing the inscription and panelling was a fine oak half an inch thick, laid on the inch elm cover. The whole was covered in red silk velvet, of which much remained attached to the wood, and it had been covered not only the sides and ends, but also the ornamented oak cover, as though the bare wood had not been thought rich enough without the velvet. The sight of this secluded and narrow tomb, thus compressing in the closest grasp the two Tudor sisters, partners of the same throne and grave, sleeping in the hope of resurrection. The solemn majesty of the great queen thus reposing, as can hardly be doubted by her own desire, on her sister's coffin, was the more impressive from the contrast of its quiet calm with the confused and multitudinous decay of the Stuart vault, and of the fullness of its tragic interest with the vacancy of the deserted space which had been hith her to explored in the other parts of the chapel. The vault was then immediately closed. This was the last time that the burial vault of Elizabeth I was opened, and this is the clearest account as to what it looks like to this day. There may be other times in which the burial vault was opened, however this is not known about, and still today the remarkable tomb of Elizabeth I marks the very site where just underneath the floor the brilliant final Tudor Queen lays to rest. Thank you for watching, and to support, please subscribe to Her Remarkable History. Thank you.